So this final session is looking at independent living and family life with three excellent speakers. You can read their full biographies in the booklet that you have here. So the first speaker is Robert Martin, a very distinguished person. He's a member of the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, the body at the United Nations level that has the responsibility for monitoring state compliance with the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. So I'll hand you over to Robert Martin, who has 20 minutes to speak. Thank you. Now it is his. Tēnā koutou. Greetings, everyone. I'm very pleased to be here to contribute to making Articles 12, 19, 23 of the CRPD real. I believe this discussion on independent living and family life is very important. I grew up in a number of institutions around New Zealand and I'm going to share a little of my story with you today. I was put into a large institution called Kimberley when I was just a toddler. I was two hours away from my sister and my family home in Whanganui. When I cried from my family, they didn't come, so I spent most of my childhood alone with no family or friends. How was I supposed to learn about the world when I was locked away from it? Sometimes I hear people say, oh yes, I know what it was like, even though they never lived in one of these places. You can have all the empathy in the world, but unless you have lived in an institution, you will never know what it really feels like. When you are shut away from the world, you are not treated as a real person with a life that actually matters. Children are not picked up and loved and cuddled because there were so many of them. They're just a number. I was shifted around a lot. I didn't belong anywhere and was moved with no notice. We were not given our own clothes, but we had to share a pool of clothes and grab what we could. We were even color-coded into groups and had stars and labels and categories. We were not treated as individuals. We all had the same haircuts on the same day. In fact, people said we all looked the same. I remember once I got really sick and I lay on the floor all day. I was a, I was a kid who was always uh, active and uh, kicking the ball. But nobody even noticed me lying there on the floor. Not only are institutions places of neglect, abuse, there can be places where people are denied their most basic human rights and basically denied a proper life. People with the power over others are easily corrupted and behind closed doors, the human rights of others are often violated. During my 15 years in large institutions, there was violence, neglect and abuse everywhere you looked. People were hosed down and left in their dirty clothes and put in isolation and had things taken off of them. Punishment was severe and out of proportion to the behaviour. I learnt not to trust people and just try and, and survive as the best I could. I became defensive and on guard all the time just to keep away from the violence and abuse. When I got out of the large institution, I went to a small, smaller ones, and the staff member tried to make me call her mum. Eric from the Disability Rights International told you a bit about this story yesterday. Trying to make me call her mum was bad enough. I already had a mum, and there was no way I was going to call that woman mum. 
But the other part of the story is when I said no, the staff slapped me, so I slapped it back as well. My life in institutions meant I was pers personally had nothing and no one to call my own. I learned that I was n a nobody and that life didn't really matter. I often wondered when I end why I ended up in places I did just because I was born with a disability. In a way, I was actually punished for who I was, but I was one of the lucky ones. I got out. I went on to build a good life for myself. Growing up, I missed the pleasures of team sports or books, music and culture. Now I have a packed life full of books, music and sport. And I, all, and I have a person to call my own, while my wife, Linda. But I really had to really work to create a life for myself because I didn't know what life was actually made of. When I was released at the age of 15, I had to learn to live and to survive all over again. And this is very hard to do. After leaving the institution as a young man and living back in my community, I realised I didn't know lots of things that other New Zealanders did. It was like I wasn't even a citizen. There was a massive gap between me and everyone else in my community. I didn't even know about the All Blacks, New Zealand's world famous national rugby team. But like thousands of other boys, my greatest pleasure was kicking my rugby ball. Little did I know that my passion was matched by millions all around the world. I was 30 years old before I even knew I was a New Zealander. And another example we lose an institution is something that you may all take for granted. Many children have pets in their home. They have a cat to cuddle and call their own. Children in institutions do not. I adopted cats and made them my friends, but when I was moved, I lost my friends. My attachments meant nothing to others. Children raised in institutions learn that good times don't last, and people and pets come and go. The result of this is very negative. We struggle with how to relate to people and always different. We are always different and somehow catching up. Nowadays, I have a pen of my own, if I want, and no longer fear I will lose my pets, my home, my family, or friends. These things you may take for granted, but I do not. That's the difference between independent living and institutions. Now I live a proper life, but I should have had that as a child. I know that people, I know people living like this today will be going through the same things as I did. It's not just about people and big institutions. People that I know live in small group homes, don't get to choose their flatmates, what they have for tea, where they go and when they go out. And if there's a vent on, everyone in the flat has to go, or none of them do. I wonder why we are still doing this to people. State parties that have signed the CRPD have an obligation to look at how they are doing to make whites in the convention wheel. Article 12 is the most important place to start because people 
need to have supportive decision making to be able to choose where and with whom they live. There are many supportive decision making tools out there like Easy Read, Meeting Assistance and I believe we will invent many more in the future as we learn how to do this better. And people need to have legal capacity so that people have to listen to them. That, that's, that's really important. Article 19 talks about living independently and being included in the community. My friends often think being independent is about being alone and doing everything on your own. And believe you and me, some people try to scare us into not pushing to live independently by saying that's what it will mean. That we, that we will be alone. But this is not what the article means. It means being able to choose the life you want to live and not what someone else decides for you. In August 2017, the committee made a general comment number five to assist governments to start the process. The government gives, or the comment gives more information about what is meant by Article 19 and how to implement this right. In the introduction of the general comment, it talks about the history and how we got where we are today. I will read the first paragraph, as I believe it is very important to remind ourselves how we got there. I apologise that this is not in very plain language. That is something we are still working on at the UN. It says... Persons with disability have historically been denied their personal and individual choice control across all areas of their life. Many have been presumed to be unable to live independently and choose in their self-chosen communities. Support is either unavailable or tied to a particular living arrangements in community infrastructure is not universally designed. Resources are invested in institutions instead of developing possibilities for persons with disabilities to live independently in the community. This has led to abandonment, dependence on families, institutionalization, isolation and segregation. We know better. It's time to move from this history. We need to look at examples of deinstitutionalization around the world. We can learn from the good things and from the mistakes. As I said yesterday, institutionalization is not just about bricks and mortar. It's the thoughts feelings and actions of others that institutionalise people. By that I mean institutions are places where people have no choice. Maybe new buildings are smaller and newer and they may even look like regular homes but it doesn't mean people inside them have more choice or in control. Implementing Article 19 and General Comment Number 5 is a, a paradigm shift from out of sight and out of mind to inclusive communities, services, schools and societies. Disabled people should grow, disabled children should grow up in a safe and caring family environment. However, families need to be well supported. 
countries must start putting in great support for families so children can stay in families. Disabled children should be able to join in and be part of all things happening in their community. Schools need to be truly inclusive, no exceptions. Education is not a privilege. It's a basic human right all over the world. This will mean disabled children can go to their own local schools in their neighbourhood alongside other children and their family on their street. And families need to start listening to disabled adults. A lot of the time people, the people who are arguing the loudest to put us in group homes are the families. And in some places they make segregated communities for us to be safe. Yes, we need to be safe. We need to make the community safer, not keep us separate. We want to live. Countries need to think about the same things everyone else needs to live their lives and make sure that this is available for disabled people, such as safe, affordable housing that is accessible different options for housing, real choice of who you live with and where and how you live. Services are accessible for all transport so people can get out and about and around their community. Additionally, there needs to be good systems for disability <coughs> support that puts a choice and control in the hands of disabled people not service providers. There needs to be a deeper understanding of the CRPD and the rights of disabled people and the shift of, in attitudes of non-disabled people. Disabled people must be part of, must be able to be part of every, everything, not excluded from everything. Countries need to work closely with disabled people's organisations and others to co-design the future, a new, brighter future where there are no institutions where disabled people, where disabled people take their rightful place alongside people in families, schools, workplaces, communities, and society, and in the world. Kia kaha, stay strong, thank you. Thank you very much, Robert. That was really, I think, a very powerful um, story. That thank you for sharing with us, really putting in context Article 19, the right to live and be included in the community and um, being able to choose the life that you want to live. So thank you very much for that. Um, our next speaker is Elizabeth Kamundia from the Kenyan National Commission on Human Rights. And Elizabeth, Elizabeth is a graduate of our LLM and International Comparative of Disability Law here at the Centre for Disability Law and Policy. So thank you. Um, yeah. Thank you, Charles, for, for the introduction. Um, delighted to be back in Galway. Um, and uh, today I'd like to speak a bit about um, independent living and family life. And I would like to begin by speaking about uh, the perspective from which I'm coming to this. I work at the Kenya National Commission on Human Rights, which is Kenya's national human rights institution. It's the institution that is <coughs> mandated to monitor the rights of persons with disabilities under Article 33.2 of the Convention. So it's the monitoring agency, basically, of, 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 of the Convention. I also come to this as a family member. My father had a disability, so this whole question of family has been interesting, just getting the presentation ready, both from the personal and also from the professional perspective. Um, and so in terms of how this is organized, 
Um, I'd like to structure the presentation in uh, these three ways. First, to just talk about the linkages between independent living and family life. Um, just drawing very much from what Robert has already spoken about and drawing also from some of the work that, that we've done on this. I'd also like to discuss a bit how family members can support or restrict the exercise of the right to live independently and be included in the community. And if we'll still have time after that, then we'll run through um, a couple of recommendations. Um, so in terms of independent living and family life and the linkages between these two, how I did this was look at concluding <laughs> observations issued by the committee on the rights of persons with disabilities. So far, there have been around 12 African countries whose state reports have been examined by the CRPD committee. So there's quite a bit to draw from. Um, and so I just looked through a couple of countries selected by region, um, Kenya, South Africa, Niger, Gabon, Morocco, just to you know, represent the different um, regions. And I was trying to see what the committee is saying to these countries in relation to Article 19 and in relation to Article 23, and what linkages could be made then there from. Um, and I think the first uh, linkage is in relation, of course, to institutionalization. And the committee has made this remark to nearly all of those countries, which is about being concerned about the institutionalization of persons with disabilities. And of course, this is one of the main ways in which people with disabilities are denied the right to, um, to family life. So, the, in the Kenyan context, I think it's important to, to just state that as opposed to many countries in the global north where there was a clear state policy towards the institutionalization of people with disabilities, um, the Kenyan context has been more like people with disabilities living in their families but without supports, without community-based supports and having community services be very inaccessible. So that even if you look at the um, drafting history of the convention, many countries from the global south when this, when this Article 19 was being discussed, were bringing more questions of family, right? How people with disabilities will be supported within families rather than um, the question of institutionalization. But having said that, there are two main contexts in which I've seen institutionalization in the Kenyan context, and this may be true for some of the other African countries as well. And this is in the context of mental health. So we do have large institutions where people with psychosocial disabilities are tend to, you know, to be kept and in some cases for really long indefinite periods. And also in the context of orphanages. So there are orphanages across the board for children. Um, and particularly this, this has been the way children um, in, in the context of HIV AIDS, particularly in the 80s and the 90s were taken care of. So in orphanages and also children with disabilities. So institutionalization has often been in these two contexts. And um, this is true for the Kenyan context and for some of the African countries as well. Um, so having said that then, the other linkage is closely related to institutionalization, which is where the committee has expressed concern about the absence of measures to return children with disabilities who are currently in orphanages to a family setting. And I'm um, delighted that Eric of DRI and Fatma of the Kenya Association for the Intellectually Handicapped are here because they did a study in Kenya on this question of children with disabilities being in orphanages. And I know Fatma will probably talk about it a bit more tomorrow. But for now, it just suffices to read one of the quotes from a grandmother of a child who was rescued from, the, from an institution. And this is what she had to say that children should not be kept in institutions. They and their families should be provided assistance for the child to remain at home. 
The people seeking to help children should talk to the guardians and understand the needs of the child within the home, not in an institutional setting. And I was reflecting about this and looking at the committee's recommendation and thinking about how this grandmother in rural Kenya is expressing exactly what the committee is telling the, the country, right? Because then the committee said, the country should take steps to increase support to families of children with disabilities to ensure they can be raised within the family home. So clearly, we are all seeing where the problem is and we are all seeing what needs to be done. And it, 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 just, it just makes sense, I, I think. So, um, so this is, this is one, of, one of the key issues, one of the key interlinkages. So the other interlinkage is something I mentioned earlier, which is about people with disability living in the community but without support, right? Um, this is where the committee recommended then that states parties um, adopt the necessary measures to prevent isolation or segregation of persons with disabilities from the community by being hidden in the family. So people with disabilities, um, do have this, these experiences and part of it is driven by stigma where families, you know, may have just difficulties as a result of the, the stigma that is around disability and part of it really is about lack of services and how inaccessible the whole, um, the setups are. So for example, if you even link it to education, in the absence of a school that is close by that can offer education to children with disabilities on an equal basis with others, children with disabilities usually need to go to boarding schools, which are like residential facilities, which tend to be far away from the home. And in these contexts, they have to pay boarding fees, even if we say education is free, but they must pay fees. And so for many families, many of which are poor, they cannot afford to basically take their children to school. So then what ends up happening is if they still have to earn a living, in the absence of community-based services, then children with disabilities end up in these situations where they are hidden or locked up within their families. But just to add a bit of nuance to this, right? So part of the, the, the difficulty um, in terms of children being hidden also varies by impairment type. So for people with, in, with albinism, part of the concerns are around safety. And I'll read a bit from the report of the independent expert on the enjoyment of human rights by persons with albinism who paid a visit to Kenya last year. And the independent expert says in her 2019 report, that in places such as Embu County and in Nairobi, there is a constant ubiquitous fear of attack and kidnapping for persons with albinism and their family members. The independent expert noted that the fear was not only perpetuated by actual cases of physical attacks and danger, but also by the hypervisibility of persons with albinism and the unwanted and threatening attention they constantly receive. When walking down the streets, persons with albinism, irrespective of their age and gender, are called money or pesa or millions to indicate that their body parts are sellable for significant amounts of money. So in, over, the, over the past couple of years, people with albinism across a number, I think around 28 African countries, there have been around 600 attacks against people with albinism based on the belief that their body parts are, you know, will bring about riches or wealth. And so, um, and so in, 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 in this, in such a context, part of being hidden or not taking part in community life is also about how safe you are and how well the, the justice system operates in terms of keeping people safe and ensuring, um, you know, redress for violations of, of, of this kind. Um, but just moving on then to one of the other issues that the committee expressed concern about, and it's about the absence of support, of community support services um, that provide 
for inclusion of persons with disabilities in society, and in particular for persons with psychosocial and intellectual disabilities. So I think the lack of community support services is true for the Kenyan context and also for quite a number of African countries. There is no um, state-funded personal assistance program in Kenya as we speak. There is um, hardly um, most of the peer support in terms of mental health is organized and funded, uh, is organized by organizations of people with disabilities, but is mostly funded by development partners rather than by the state, although there has been a few cases where the state is beginning to take this up. Um, so whatever services people need, many times even sign language interpretation in meetings that are public, um, people who are deaf may be required to come with their own sign language interpreter. So if you think about Article 19C, which is about um, services that are accessible to the general public, also being accessible to people with disabilities on an equal basis with others, then it's clear where the, the gaps are, right? That a lack of a really coherent, coordinated way of providing support to people with disabilities is really, um, you know, is really a hindrance and is a, is a big is a big barrier in this regard. Um, the committee also expressed concern about the absence um, of community support services for those abandoned by their families. So you see, it's one thing if you have family and who are supportive, because then by and large, they will bridge what the state is supposed to do. And I'm drawing quite a bit now from Bo Chen's presentation earlier, where she talk, he talked about how you know gaps in what the state is supposed to do leads to families having to take up extra responsibility that is really within the the realm of state obligations, right? So um, our last national survey for persons with disabilities was conducted quite a while ago. Um, this was in 2008, and in this survey, more than half of persons with disabilities at household level were likely to be helped by family members in daily activities. So persons with disabilities, for example, in some regions, the western and the northeastern parts of Kenya, were up to 71% and 74% respectively likely to be supported in their daily activities by family members. So then what happens for in cases where someone doesn't have family that can support them, or in the situation that was raised where also the, the parents have a disability and the children have a disability. And so in, in those contexts then, there's really quite an absence in terms of what what people can, can rely on. Um, so this is related to what I've spoken before, and it's about just emphasizing the differences between rural areas and also looking at intersectionality. So refugees with disabilities, migrants with disabilities, some of the um, expressions of concern have been around this, these questions. If I think about my work at the commission as well, so this is about um, the lack of information on the available uh, support services that may exist, right? So if I think about the complaints we receive as a commission, in many cases, people with disabilities come to the commission to complain, for example, that they have been registered with the National Council for Persons with Disabilities, but they are not receiving um, a grant. Um, but a registration doesn't equal a grant, right? The criteria for um, cash transfers is very tightly uh, defined. But it seems that this information doesn't get to people when they are being registered for purposes of capturing data. So we deal with a lot of cases where you're just explaining that, you know, registration is about them gathering data to, to, to plan but criteria for being eligible for cash transfer is about severe, um, severe poverty, um, persons who require a, an intensive level of support. Just the information itself, there's a, a break in, in, in that sense. 
Um, then in terms of how family members can support the exercise of the right to live independently and be included in the community, I'll read again from the Kenya National Survey, which was done quite a while ago, but I think it makes the point um, that, um, so the survey notes that 75% of persons with disabilities were likely to attend family events with people in urban areas registering a higher proportion than rural residents. And the survey showed a remarkable proportion of persons with disabilities who were likely to feel involved and part of the family and who are also involved in family con conversations at 92% and 90%. And why is this significant? I think it's significant because if you're going to be supported by family members to live in the community, inclusion must surely begin at home, right? So it must begin with the small things. Are you part of the family conversation? Are you included at that level, right? Have the family you know, being able to just not stigmatize within that private space. I think that's the first level of inclusion, and this seems to, you know, to show um, a, good, a good sign. Um, and then I think in the, the report also, in our state reports, in terms of um, how family members can support the exercise of the right to live independently in the community, as well, this, the report notes that most persons with disabilities depend on their families for social, financial, material, and psychological support. And I think this is true for all of us, for everyone, you know. In, in our context, we, as a family, depended on our father for social, financial, and material support, and he also depended on us you know, as we grew older for some of these things. So within a family setup, this is what happens. The problem is the lack of choice for people with disabilities in a context where there are no state-funded support services, you know, so that then it just affects power dynamics negatively. Um, it, it makes it uh, seem as if it's only people with disabilities who are depending on the other family members for these things. But that, you know, that is a distortion of, 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 of the true situation. Um, I'll speak now about... Um, restrictions and how family members restrict the exercise of the right to live independently. And one of the ways is denying persons with disabilities the right to marry and raise a family. When Alberto was speaking earlier, he spoke about de facto guardianship, whereby even if a person with disability is not under formal guardianship, their, the restrictions they experience in their daily life are as if they were under formal guardianship. This is the situation for many people with disabilities in Kenya. And there's a case, SW versus NGK, in which it's a divorce course. Um, our law allows divorce um, on the ground that, our marriage act allows divorce on the ground that someone is Re subject to recurrent feats of insanity. That is the unfortunate language of the law. Um, it also allows that a marriage can be nullified on the same basis. And in this case, the court said um, that the respondent, who was the husband, has testified that she, his wife, from whom he was seeking a di an annulment, sorry, it's not a divorce, it was an annulment of the marriage in this case, has recurrent fits of insanity, lives with her parents, has no regular income, and finds it difficult to look after herself, and is unsuited to have custody of the young LK, who was their son. The young LK is at the moment in the custody of the respondent, the father, pursuant to the trial magistrate's order. The appellant has failed to persuade me that she ought to have custody of this child. Her plea is accordingly rejected. So as I wind up, what hap ends up happening in this case shows the linkages of Article 12, Article 19, and Article 23, right? So there's the, the denial of legal capacity in being denied the right to marry, but there's also that in making the decision as to who has custody of this child, the court is saying she has no regular income, so the question of the extent to which the, support, the state supports people with disabilities who are not in employment. The court is saying she lives with her parents. 
you know, again, lack of living housing arrangements that are supportive to people with disabilities. She finds it difficult to look after herself and is unsuited to have custody of the young LK. What support do parents with disabilities have in exercising their right to family? And so I think this is a good place to stop. I'm, I'm happy to stop here and the, the rest of, of, of the presentation is on, on the Dropbox. Thank you very much. Thanks, Elizabeth, for another excellent um, presentation. Now, our final speaker in this session on independent living and family life is Seneda Halotrevich, um, and she is a member of the steering group of the European Platform of Staff Advocates, um, also with Inclusion Europe, and from Croatia. So I'll hand you over to Santana. Thank you. And I let no school look out. Well, Javins is another Halitovich, the Razim is Havatske, Radim Utrus is a Samosa Stupane, Yodis and Preston is a Inclusion Europe EFC. So, hello, uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Senada Halilcevic. Uh, thank you for inviting me to your summer school to Galway. Um, uh, I come from Croatia and I work at the Association for Self-Advocacy. And I am here uh, as a member of Inclusion Europe and a European platform for, of self-advocates. Inclusion Europe se bori za jednaka prava i punu uključenost osoba sa intelektualnim teškoćama i njihovim obiteljima. Želimo vidjeti svijet u kojem se osobe sa intelektualnim teškoćama imaju ista prava kao i svi drugi. So, Inclusion Europe uh, fights for equal rights and full inclusion of people with intellectual disabilities and their families. Uh, we want to see a world where people with intellectual disabilities enjoy the same rights as everyone, everywhere, all the time. Inclusion Europe ima sedandespet članova iz 39 zemalja. To su različite organizacije stručnjaka, roditelja, pružatelja, usluka i drugo. So, Inclusion Europe uh, has uh, 75 uh, members uh, from 39 countries and those are different uh, parent organizations or uh, service providers. EPSA je dio Inclusion Europe. EPSA ima 19 članova iz 16 zemalja i u EPSI su samo uključene o samozastupnici i njihove organizacije. So, a European platform of uh, self-advocates has uh, 19 members from 16 countries and only self-advocates and self-advocacy organizations are part of uh, EPSA. Danas ću vam pričati o projektu koji je Istražujemo nasilje prema ženama s invaliditetom. Today I will talk to you about a research on violence against women. Inclusion Europe sada provodi projekt o nasilju prema ženama s invaliditetom. I da je projekt financiran od OSF-a. U prvom dijelu projekta radili smo 
интервьюируется десят женщин из женские заключатели интервью написали написаны публикации живот на код на седах публикация я написана у лайка разумливому плейку и имею сличиться за более разумные бани. So Inclusion Europe is currently implementing a project on violence against women with intellectual disabilities. Uh, the project is funded by the Open Society Foundation and the project has two parts. In the first part, uh, we interviewed uh, 10 women with intellectual disabilities from Netherlands. The conclusion of these interviews are presented in the publication that's called A Life After Violence. And uh, this publication is easy to read and it also has uh, pictures so people can better understand the content. Sadju samo kratko pripričati sadržaj populacije. Žene koje smo intervjuirani doživili su nasilje u institucijama. Doživili su različite vrste nasilja. Bilo je ne strah. So in that uh, publication called Life After Violence, you can read how the women we interviewed experienced uh, violence in the institutions. Uh, they experienced different types of violence and they were uh, very scared to talk about it. Uh, the violence they experienced had a big uh, effect on their life. Uh, some of them didn't get the help they needed and they were having a, a really hard time. The effect of the violence stayed with them even when they moved from institution to the community. And uh, that stopped them from being fully included in the community. So uh, now we are doing uh, the same interviews with women from uh, five other countries. That's the second part of the project. Those five countries are uh, Austria, Croatia, Italy, Lithuania and Romania. Um, the aim is to compare experiences of women with, uh, uh, from different uh, countries and we want to see if there are uh, some similar uh, experiences or are there any uh, differences. Uh, so in Croatia we did this interviews just a couple of days ago, so we didn't have the time uh, to write about it in this presentation, but at the end, at the Q&A uh, portion, we can talk about that if you want. Rezultati projekta će te biti objavljeni, ali mi o nasilju 
Da scova da moina sa stancima samo zastupnika. Kada na sa stancima samo zastupnika da scova da mo nasilju na par minuta nastane tišina. Osjeća se neugodnost i napetost. Svako od nas ima neko iskustvo sa nasiljem. Nasilje se događa svugde u školama, na ulici i obitelji. So the results of this project will be published at the end of the year. But we also talk about the violence at our self-advocacy uh, meetings. And we, when we talk about it, there's always a few minutes of silence. And you can always feel the tension in the room. Because everyone has some experience with violence. Uh, it happens everywhere, in school, in the streets, and in the families. Ovim projektom želimo znašiti žene da pričaju o nasilju. Naš cilj je osvijestiti širu realnost o ovom problemu. Organizirat ćemo različite događanja gdje ćemo predstaviti projekt. Želimo i suradnje živati sa organizacijama koje rade za žrtvama, ženama nasilja i sensibilizirati za rad sa ženama s intelektualnim teškođama. So with this project we want to empower women to talk about violence. Uh, our goal is also to uh, raise awareness uh, to public about this issue. We will uh, organize various events where we, were, uh, where we will present the project to the public and the results. And our goal is to uh, cooperate with uh, different organizations who are working with women, victims of violence, and who are fighting for women's rights. kao našu slabost i svoju moć prikazuju na loš način. Znaju da mnoge osobe od nas ne mogu prepoznati ekonomsko i psihičko nasilje. Znaju da se bojimo pričati o fizičkom nasilju i da nam često ljudi, drugi ljudi neće vjerovati. Zato za mene neovisan, nedostojanstven život znači živiti gdje se osjećam i ja sam sigurna od svakog nas. Yeah. <coughs> so often other people use our intellectual disabilities as our weakness. They use their power over us in a bad way. They know that uh, many of us cannot recognize economic or psychological uh, violence. And they also know that we are often afraid to talk about physical violence. And um, they, they are also aware that if we even talk about violence, that other people won't believe us. So for me, to live independently and with dignity, it is important to be and feel safe from violence. So other information about this project and the final ver version of the publication you can find at uh, Inclusion Europe uh, web page and we will like to, to stay in contact. Thank you.
Great. Thank you very much, Sanada, for that excellent presentation. Really interesting project that she's involved with. Um, we don't have much time left, so we realistically have time for one, possibly two questions. So put your hands up if you have a really good question. <laughs> Only a really, really good question. And we decide we have time for two of them. So hands up with a really good question. So nobody had a good question. I'll take a moderately good question, so. 